Mr. Ramvier, you have been involved in agribusiness in Nigeria, um, other parts of Africa, India, China, and um, I would like to hear your perspectives on the Nigerian agri-food industry, especially at this moment, and then what lessons do you think we can learn from um, some other parts of the world? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Femi, for having me on the panel. I'm very happy to be uh, talking to this audience and sharing the panel with my other friends and colleagues here. I will start with a little bit of myself and I will add perspectives of Singapore and India and what I see going forward. Uh, so Oluva introduced as 27 years of my experience. Let me just correct that. I completed 30 years of working experience. All of it is in agri sector. I came to Nigeria in 93 for Olam and I stayed on on the African continent for 16 years before moving to Singapore. So that's my background. I did not stay many, many years in Nigeria, but I have been around and I'm very familiar with the Nigerian situation on ground. So please do not assume that I will talk only with the Singapore perspective. Yes, I have not been to Sokoto, but I have been to Meduguri. I have lived in Enugu, I have lived in Ekorin. So I'm, I, I have been quite familiar and I have kept in touch with Nigeria. We are talking about our challenges, but let me just throw first line about Singapore. Singapore does not produce its own food and all its food comes from about 40 countries across the world. You can imagine our situation in Singapore during COVID. Just now, Mr. Tosin Muiva was talking about the challenges of cross-border movement of goods. You can imagine how Singapore is taking care of its own food requirement, right? We were just in a world, six months ago, we were talking about how I don't need any middleman, I just use my phone and I can order my own daily requirement of food from anywhere in the world. We are talking about global efficiencies. We were talking about globalization, open borders, and COVID has shown us the fallacy of that framework. I will make a mention about India because Ms. Lois Sanke has been very rightly highlighting the challenges in the rural areas. So I was talking to a farming community in India just last week and they told me the scenario is like this, that the lockdown is very strict in the metros in India, but it is the harvesting season for wheat in the north of India and the farmers are able to go and harvest. The infrastructure available for farmers in India to deliver their goods is of an order that I would really like that we can create in Nigeria. That a farmer has access to a market to deliver his goods and have a fair price for it. So those two mentions I will make. We have been lucky and blessed in Nigeria. You know, I, we haven't much spoken about it, but before the 70s, Nigeria's main economy was agriculture. Yes. It was an agriculture superpower in the region. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Then we have the people. We today talk about 70% people working in agriculture in Nigeria. We talk about agriculture contributing 22% to the GDP of the country. But study of macroeconomics will tell all of us that this 70% people working in agriculture is a sign of weakness. It will go down progressively below 50%, below 20% it will go if we do our act right. And I will still come back to this point. And agriculture which is contributing more than 20% to the global economy of Nigeria will also come down. You know, you look at countries, the direction of Nigeria's progress will be that agriculture component of GDP will come down. But let me come back to COVID. Do I have any doubt that COVID is wrecking a havoc in the country, in Nigeria? 
the farmers would have surely produced and that produce itself cannot reach the consumer in the city. So that is the scale of our challenge. We have poor farmers and while surely the rich uh, parts of Lagos will get their food, but we do not have a line of sight and we do not have data about the economically challenged parts of Lagos that they, how do they get access to their food? So surely COVID will end up highlighting all those weaknesses in our system. In a way, I will side with Ade, my dear friend and colleague, when he says that I am an optimist, I see an opportunity. I have never had an opportunity to talk so strongly about agriculture, local production, and associated supply chain. So Ade will be thrilled at this opportunity. The crisis is real. Yes. And the crisis is there because we were not ready for it. We oh, have yes. not been ready for it for more than two decades. But I will hope that we will learn from it and we will be more ready going forward. For me, I'll take a short break here and okay. continue with my next step because there is a change in my message from here. <laughs> before I move on. Thank you very much, uh, Ramya. Thank you. That is deep and thoughtful um, coming from uh, somebody from outside Nigeria. You're very right. There's a lot of opportunity here. I also want to be optimistic about the, about the, um, the opportunities and the, and the prospects. It's just for us to align our capabilities appropriately. 